melt out. So, and this happens to me a lot. So one of my collaborators, he was working on junk, or junction placoglobin, or JUPE. I'm going to call it JUPE. It's also known as gamma catenin. Uh, he comes to me and he says, hey, Mike, I know this thing is important in, in aggressive lung tumors. That when you see a metastatic, when, the, when these tumors spread, this protein get, just basically gets knocked out. That we don't see expression in most of the lung tumors anymore, right? But the problem is we don't know what the heck it does. Uh, generally, they know that it's involved in cell adhesion. So you could see how that would be important in, let's say, a metastatic tumor, right? That in order for the, tumor, the cancer to spread, it's got to detach from its neighbors. So what happens is it loses this protein so that these cells can then go spread all over the, the place. The problem is they don't know how it works, that if you're going to use this as a therapy, you better know how it works. So I did that. I said, okay, give it to me. I got two crowds that are just raring to go. Let's, let's take a look at this. So first off, you, you better have, you know, differential expression in all your cell types. And you could see, so here would be the relative expression. This is log two expression. So you can see there's a huge scale here that certain cell types express this gene in, in, in many different ways. So this will give me a good range to actually do the correlations on. So when I did that for both of these, these crowds or these lung cancer data sets, I ended up with 152 that were common to both data sets. So 152 genes that are either positively or negatively correlated to JUP. Okay. These are the genes that I'm going to look at. This is what's going to give me an idea of what JUPE's doing and potentially give my collaborator who works on lung cancer targets to actually go after. And I'm going to mention too is that everything I'm going to tell, talk about basically represents 0.06% of the genome, right? I'm talking about a very small set. And what you'll find is that these small sets, you'll get lots and lots of biological relationships come out. So how does this work? And I'm going to explain pathway analysis in one slide. Everybody's looking at me like, yeah, sure you are. <laughs> no, I am. Honestly, the statistics behind all of this stuff is incredibly, incredibly easy, right? So I'm going to give you an example. So say I have this, I know that this, um, uh, pathway is important in lung cancer. And I want to, and it's made of 40 members, right? And they're all given here. And now I want to, I want to determine whether this pathway is playing a role in my 152 genes that are correlated to JUPE. Okay? Here is the critical part, and this is why this, all this stuff works, is there's a limited amount of genes that we can pick from, right? that these 40 members of this pathway are part of the approximately 25,000 human genes in the human genome. We have a limited thing to pick from. So you can picture these are 40 green balls in a sea of 25,000 or pink balls. I used to say blue balls, but then the high school kids would <laughs> giggle and <laughs> so it's turned to green to pink. Okay, so imagine I get 152 draws from this, 25, this big pile of balls, what are the odds that I pull out one pink ball, right? Probably, you know, that's not really rare, right? That if I got this in my 152 genes, I'd be like, yeah, so what? But what happens now if I get three of these pathway members in my 152 genes? Probabilities go way up. That the odds of doing that by random chance are incredibly low. Now what happens if I get seven of these? In this instance, if I got seven of these 40 out of a possible, you know, 25,000 genes just drawn randomly, that's not random anymore. What this is telling me is that this pathway is probably playing a role in the genes that I'm looking at. And this might be a pathway that my collaborator might want to go after. This is bioinformatics. And what you can see is that all this takes is a contained biological unit, and we can make these units anything we want. We can make them establish pathways. We can make them a list of genes that are known to interact with, say, a chemical or a drug. We can make them, you know, genes that are associated with a particular biological function. 
In this case, you know, cell adhesion might be a big thing, right? We use this all the time, that the fact that we have a limited amount of things to choose from allows us to do this statistics. And it's just basically kind of a modified Fisher's exact test. So what do we get in that 152 genes? Well, and that's what you expect is not only, you know, do I want to see genes that are related, but I want to see, you know, these, you know, overrepresented pathways pop up because these things should be working together. And sure enough, what you do is you find a lot of cancer stuff in here. Again, remember, I just correlated to gene expression. This is 152 genes. These p-values are off the chart. Again, you know, he mentioned that this is important in metastatic tumors. Now I've got invasion of tumor cell lines. That's relevant to what I'm looking at. This makes me feel good about the list I just generated. Not only that, but we know a lot about these genes, that we can, we've got a lot of intel on them. We know basically if they go up or down, whether that pathway would be more activated or more inhibited. Some of the most inhibited pathways, when jupe goes up, genes that are important in metastasis or the spreading, the aggressive forms of the cancer go down. Conversely, the most activated things, and remember that junction placoglobin plays a role in that cell adhesion stuff, some of the most active things are adhesion of cell lines. Again, this makes us, we're basically putting biological context to this list we just created. I'm fleshing it out. I'm making a picture basically with the pixels now. We can even be more specific. I can say, well, let's look at some of these cell adhesion, you know, type pathways. Everything colored in here was on our list of 152 genes. If it's, green, if it's red, it was positively correlated. If it was green, it was negatively correlated. Look at all of these things associated with cell adhesion and tight junction sh signaling going up or being, actually being positively correlated. This makes biological sense. And when I see stuff like this, this makes me feel good about the gene list that I'm looking at. Uh, what are some other stuff? So not only can we get, I think the true power of bioinformatics is not finding out what we already know, but it's finding these new relationships. And I, hopefully I'll have time to talk about that. You know, I call them gangs, you know, networks. So what the software will allow me to do is say, okay, you've got these 152 genes. Is there any relationships, direct or indirect, in the literature for them to, to, to interact? So if there's a positive line here, there's somewhere in the literature that says there's a direct relationship there. If it's dashed, it's an indirect relationship. And you can click on these and you can find the relationships. But basically, when I put my 152 genes, all these relationships pop up. And you might say, well, so what? <laughs> well, I say that the odds of this happening by random chance are 1 times 10 to the negative 70th, right? I have now have another gene. If you guys have questions, you can ask me, you know, go ahead, raise your hand or anything like that. We now have a new network. If you look in the literature, the only, and remember, we correlated to JUPE. The only thing that actually has a relationship in the, in the scientific literature is this relationship here with PKP3. Again, I have taken what is known and I've expanded it. Now I've got a bigger interacting signaling network for JUPE. Yeah? When you say program, what program in specific are you using? Ingenuity Pathway Analysis, which right now is probably the most powerful bioinformatics software on the planet. So what it does is it's a human curated database. The uh, legend has it that there's some island off of uh, San Francisco where they got a bunch of uh, postdocs chained to their computers just going through the PubMed, categorizing all these things. The human, human curated databases, you know, there are a lot, I would much rather use them than, usually what happens is a, there's a lot of bioinformatics software, but it's all text searching, right? That all these genes that we're looking at have text associated with them. And what most of these, like especially the freeware software solutions, so IPA is a commercial software package. The, the freeware stuff just goes, okay, we've got all these terms. What are all these terms that are showing up more than what we'd expect by random chance? And they group the genes based on these terms. Here we're, we're grouping them based on the literature itself. 
and these relationships that they have teased out of the data, uh, out of these papers. Okay, and a green would be down, but we're actually working on this. This has been validated, and I, I think what you're going to see here, I, I'll, I'll show, I'm going to talk about the spent one because this is very interesting. So now I've kind of got its true signaling network. Now I need to find a target so I can actually manipulate jupe activity, right? If I can increase junction placoglobin metastatic tumors, maybe people don't get, you know, uh, aggressive cancers. And that's kind of what my collaborator is working on. And again, not only that, but then we can overlay different biological processes on the network we just created. And again, cell adhesion plays a huge role. A lot of these things are cell adhesion molecules, which you would expect. But what I didn't expect is all this cancer metastatic stuff, right? A lot of these genes have previously been known to be associated with a cancer we're actually looking at. And that's a great sign. Not only so I've, are we getting similar genes when I correlate in two different data sets, but we're seeing if it's positively correlated in one data set, it's also positively correlated in the other. And that the most significant genes seem to be ranked about the same in both data sets. So if you look here, so here are my top 10 genes that were correlated to uh, JUPE in my two data sets. You can see there's a lot of cross uh, identification of these genes. And even if it's not the same gene, it seems to be a related isoform. But I'm going to talk about this one here. And this is what's got our attention is that spent, or spent be, was the top correlated gene in both data sets. Here's our entry in, right? I've used statistics. I used the crowd to kind of get me to this point. Now I can have, potentially have a target to look at. So what is spent? Um, it's a serine pro 